Hi, I have Mike Nepulse, and today I'm going to talk about Fallout 4, and specifically the DLCs, in the third part of my Fallout 4 rewrite series. This might be a long one, since there's a lot of ground to cover. Let's get started. First, most of this is independent from the other two rewrite videos. Feel free to watch them, but you don't need to. So, Part 1, Crush, Kill, Destroy. First, there's the Automatron DLC, which is pretty good. It's really just the delivery mechanism for the new robot crafting mechanic, which is a cool mechanic that I hope we'll see more of in the future, hopefully with even more combinations. It's still weirdly short, just a quest line instead of a world space, but I'm trying not to stretch the budget too much, so... Only changes are to have an option to convince the mechanist to keep making robots after you defeat her, but have them be good this time and or under Minuteman control, to buff some of the weapons because they're not quite viable, and maybe to give us some of the cool robot exclusive weapons like hammer saws and drills and crushing claws, because it's lame that they get weapons we don't when they're already at least partially modeled and animated, though again, time and budget, that's pretty much it. Moving on. Part 2. Never settle for less. There are three settlement DLCs that we'll talk about all at once, and asking if they're good and whether they could be improved or replaced with something better. To figure out whether something is good settlement content, we need to figure out what good settlement content is, and that's somewhat complicated by the fact that settlements don't serve just one purpose. They are different things to different people, and I think the five main playstyles are 1. Architects, who like to build and decorate. 2. Survivors, who use them as player bases and for resource generation. 3. Generals, who want to rebuild civilization and the Minutemen. 4. Mayors, who care about the people in the settlements, though they're not really big in Fallout 4 since most settlers are generic NPCs and even the ones with names and faces don't get much development. 5. Adventurers, who don't care about settlements and think the whole thing was a waste of resources. Overall, the settlement DLCs have a lot of architect stuff with concrete, warehouse greenhouse sets, and vault structures, and a bunch of decorations. Some survivor stuff, since cages can provide food and money and you can use manufacturing to make bullets and equipment, though for the equipment I might just be a city boy, but it seems kind of a pointless to make it yourself when you can just have it delivered. Not much general stuff, not really any mayor stuff, and nothing for adventurers. There's also a lot of tinker stuff with all of the contraptions, but I think all of the tinkers are busy making things out of redstone in Minecraft. So my proposed change is this. We keep pretty much all of Wasteland Workshop, and we take the warehouse set from contraptions and combine it with Wasteland Workshop, get rid of the gizmos and circuits and all that. We also cut the Vault Tech Workshop since the furniture looks nice, but the quest line is terrible and the rooms look really weird when not in a vault. That still leaves a decent amount of stuff for the architect, but frees up some resources. These resources would go to make something that benefits both the general and the adventurer, which is a Minuteman DLC that lets you train and recruit soldiers at the castle. You would then be able to send these soldiers to settlements for a defense boost, and more importantly, you would be able to send them both to defend settlements from attacks, and to complete radiant quests like kidnappings and raider troubles. They could be coordinated from the castle, or with a handheld radio that you found in a supply cache as part of the quest line, which would also involve some named soldiers joining or rejoining, since there should be more than two Minutemen characters. This would give the general the satisfaction of having built a real fighting force out of the Minutemen, while making retaking the castle meaningful, and free the adventurer from doing so many quests, because Emil Pagliarulo, the head writer of Bethesda, says he actively likes Radiant quests because the player gets unlimited quests for the price of one, maybe a half, but since they don't have real stories, characters, choices, clever challenges, good rewards, or any feeling that you've accomplished anything, and that's pretty much all of the reasons people play quests, they're generally terrible, and most players don't even want to play them once, so you're really getting between zero and one third of a quest for the price of half, which isn't even efficient, and it's not like Bethesda games needed time padding to begin with, so they should really focus on making real quests. Also, as a base game Minutemen fix, I would swap out a couple of minor quests in exchange for a proper rematch with the Gunners at Quincy, followed by a takeover of their base at the GNR building, and as mentioned in the last two videos, I would also let them prevent the Battle of Bunker Hill as a sort of big triumphant moment. Also have Clint, the Minutemen trader at Quincy mentioned that the Gunners didn't plan to massacre Quincy, they just wanted to occupy it, because I find that a little weird that they did. Doesn't really seem like it would be in their best interests. And they would have done so if the Minutemen hadn't persuaded people to fight back. So, so Preston would have even more trouble to deal with than you'd have to 
talk to him until he felt better. I don't know. I would also turn June Long from a pharmacist into a proper doctor, because we'd like him a lot more if he was genuinely useful, and it would add the free bonus trauma that he was not able to save his son after Quincy, despite being a doctor. Also, you should be able to talk to the Longs more about losing their kids, since almost the exact same thing just happened to you, so there's a lot of common ground there, and they should be really sympathetic. Not sure why they're not in the real game. I'm also going to say that any resources left over from these DLCs can be used to make a Wasteland Warfare DLC, focusing on combat since, again, not everyone likes settlements. I think one of the best things it could do would be to add buttons in VATS to access the special unarmed and melee moves that are in the game but can't be triggered manually, only happen in third person, and aren't mentioned anywhere even in the loading screens because it's really weird to go to all of the effort of making and animating all those special attacks and then not even telling the player about them so that you don't get any credit for them or any real utility out of them. Weird choice. The melee special attacks would need some stats to be added, but the unarmed grappling moves are mostly good to go, and making unarmed focus on grappling attacks that work well on people and badly on everything else would do a lot to give it its own separate niche from standard melee. They also need to buff power armor unarmed combat, since it does make perfect sense that you can't fit power armor gauntlets inside a boxing glove, but the armor itself should be a devastating weapon, especially since all you'd really have to do is knock someone over and then, to borrow from the Commonwealth's rich colonial history, tread on them. Plus, a built-in ballistic fist with automated reloading, or just a nice long wrist blade would do wonders. Other than that, they could just add some weapons, there's some cool concept art for extending power fists, revolver shotguns, and this cool and astute bioweapon that would definitely be a war crime to use, but you know, it's not like there's a Geneva Convention after the apocalypse. And there's a modeled but untextured Chinese assault rifle. Also a Tesla cannon that has reload animations and is in the hands of the Brotherhood would be great. Moving on, part three, Nuka World? More like... Why am I supposed to care about raiders now despite having killed every single raider on site for the last hundred hours of gameplay, cut world? You'll notice I skipped Far Harbor, and that's because it doesn't actually need a rewrite, and I'm going to give it its own video on why it's so great. Nuka World does need a rewrite because it's got some serious issues. First off, there's a total disconnect between the setting of a theme park and the plot of joining up with raider groups to take over the commonwealth. You could remove the raiders from the park and have the same plot. Second, the conflict feels shallow, since the only real point of contention among the raider groups is that the number of park sections isn't divisible by three. And if you were allowed to take over one more settlement before power play triggered, there would be no conflict at all. And third, it not only has nothing to do with the main plot, it's not something that pretty much any character not specifically created for the DLC would do. And even if you do start a new playthrough, it doesn't match up with your pre-war backstory at all. And yes, the main game didn't let you be as evil as the older games, but at the same time, most players aren't going to be evil on most playthroughs anyway, and not including a good option other than just killing everyone is ridiculous. Even if you do like being evil, it's mostly just a bunch of repetitive radiant quests anyway. So I'm going to keep the set and part of the premise, but I'm going to have to gut it a little. First issue, why is it in a theme park? Nuka World as a setting is a fun idea, but it doesn't have much of a point to it. There's nothing in it that's important, and there's no real reason for anyone to want to capture it. That being said, there is notably a lot of advanced tech in the park. Nuka Galaxy has the Star Core robot control system, the bottling plant has weaponized quantum, and the Safari has that animal cloning machine. Dry Rock Gulch and Kitty Kingdom don't have much, so I would add some mining machines to the Gulch and give Kitty Kingdom some sort of illusion tech they used for magic shows that the ghoul magician guy could use against you. This would make the park not just a place with walls, but an unexpected source of advanced technology that could alter the fate of the Commonwealth. Second issue, the Raiders. Some people like the Nuka World Raiders, I don't. The Operators and Disciples liking money and violence is not exactly novel when normal Raiders are already thieves who view human corpses as good feng shui. And the pack with their pranks and animal masks are actually a fun idea, but they only have one character, and they're still raiders, so they're all violent, amoral sociopaths who you should kill on sight. Also, again, they all want exactly the same thing, park areas and settlements, so there's no real difference or thematic conflict between them. It's just a different coat of paint. As such, I'm going to just remove the disciples and operators, have the pack live in the safari zone and not be raiders at all, and have the main raider group be the gunners, since they make sense both as a faction who could use the tech, and as a faction that might be interested in taking and holding settlements since they already have a pre-existing rivalry with the Minutemen. And I think it would be better to flesh out an existing underdeveloped group than to add three more underdeveloped group. Now, 
Plot rundown. Just before the events of the DLC, a large gunner team was sent to Nuka World in search of some advanced technology as they might have. Upon getting there, they found Nuka Town occupied by some scavengers and settlers, and they captured them, collared them, and used them for manual labor and boring jobs like trading. Seeing that the park was deactivated, one squad went to the power plant to turn everything on, which activated much of the aforementioned tech. So, the plot starts for you when you hear the recently activated broadcast, and you approach the train station and find a scavenger who escaped from the gunners and tells you about the whole situation. Your initial instinct may be to kill them all, but because every collared settler is essentially a hostage, that won't be an option, so you have to disguise yourself as a gunner, maybe get one of those blood-type tattoos, and infiltrate them by pretending you are the only survivor of a group of reinforcements. They tell you what they're doing, and put you on a team going to Dry Rock Gulch to capture it, and when you get there, your whole team is very quickly ambushed by the acid-spitting rattlesnakes that live there. Because I know bloodworms are designed as a reference to the movie Tremors, but if you're doing a Wild West thing, then rattlesnakes are far more appropriate, and you could make the quest to kill the queen be called Cut Off The Head. So then it's fairly similar to the real game, but it turns out that a big underground nest was disturbed by a mining machine that was being showed off to park guests before the war and activated when the power went on. So you have to go into the nest, kill the rattlesnake queen, and return with her heads, impressing the gunners, earning you a promotion, and unlocking the quests to capture the next park areas. So Nuka Galaxy is about the same, except there is on-site robot manufacturing, so there's a reason you need to take over the Star Core instead of just killing all the robots, which does the same job in the base game. The bottling plant is normal except the Nuka world, being filled with Nuka Cola Quantum, explode like a sentry bot when you kill them, and have health regen. Kitty Kingdom now has illusion tech being used by Oswald the Outrageous, so some of the ghouls attacking you are actually illusions and you have to figure out which ones. Maybe they have no shadows or something, though that might be an issue for people with really weak computers. The Safari Zone would be quite different because it would have the pack, who would not be raiders but instead the descendants of Aphad, who live among the animals there and protect them. They are under attack from the Gator Claws and require your help to kill them, they'd also be protecting the animals from the Gator Claws and sort of hiding in the still sturdy cages. You would earn their respect by killing the Gator Claws and fighting some of their warriors in single melee combat, and if you defeat Mason you would then become Alpha and they would listen to you and let the gunners have access to some of the machinery. So that's all of the parks, by doing them you would earn a bunch of promotions and they would put you in charge of their plan to take over the Commonwealth. They would be ruthless but not sadistic, interested in the settlements as a way to expand their power and make money. They would also be able to prevent attacks against the settlements, showing that well not nice, they have the strength to ensure order, and you would get a commission for every settlement you took. Now, if you're taking the good path, you have to figure out a way to defuse the callers on the prisoners, which would require you to ask your gunner superiors if you could take some into the Commonwealth to take some prisoners there, and then you would give them to Sturges instead, who would fiddle with them until he cracked the off signal, which you would be able to broadcast in the Commonwealth using the castle's radio tower, or in Nuka World by taking over their radio station under the guise of Sturgis repairing it. Though, unfortunately, Red Eye wouldn't fit with this rewrite and would have to be replaced with someone less fun, which is a shame, because Red Eye's actually one of my favorite parts of the DLC. So, you take over the settlements while really just telling the settlers what was happening and persuading them to go along with it as a way to trap the gunners, and after about three settlements, you tell the gunners that real victory couldn't be achieved without taking the castle. So they agree to muster a huge chunk of their forces near the castle and send you in disguised as Minutemen to attack from the inside and let them in. You go inside, tell the artillery team where they are, and open fire on them and slightly behind them, forcing them to run forward into the meat grinder that is all of your missile turrets and also you. If you're being evil, you can just side with the gunners and actually attack the castle. After killing a huge chunk of their forces at the castle, you then lead a Minutemen team to Nuka World, where Sturgis deactivates the collars, freeing the slaves to take up arms and fight along each side you and the Minutemen, which is enough to take down even the elite gunners of Nuka World. And then... You free the slaves, and everyone parties, and then you start recovering and studying the technologies so you can use them to fix the world, even though one of the major themes of Fallout is that technology will not save you, and all you can really do in the world is take it one day at a time and hope that eventually a random uber mention will show up out of nowhere and fix all of your problems. So, Nuka World Lightning Round! 1. Replace the Quantum X-01 from Nuka Galaxy with the T-51 with the Quantum-powered Super Jetpack. 2. Give Oswald the Outrageous a sword cane. There's already swords and canes, so it might not be that hard to model. 3. Add a Gator Claw Gauntlet that looks like the proper Death Claw Gauntlets of games past, and have a variant from the Albino that's big enough to fit over Power Armor. 4. Cut the Acid Soaker, give its buff function to the Squirt Gun, also cut the Paddle Ball, use any resources saved to make aforementioned weapons, which would be somewhat acid flip to begin with. 5. Make the rocket sledgehammer upgrades just be for the super sledge, since what's the point of a super sledge if there's a rocket boosted normal sledge? 6. Add a necklace slot like in Elder Scrolls where you can equip dog tags or those packed necklaces. 
Seven, the Raider weapons wouldn't fit the gunner's aesthetic, so swap out the Disciple's Blade for a Bowie knife and the Handmade Rifle for something, maybe a grenade launcher, riot shotgun, or light machine gun, probably not all three though. Also, base game, make the assault rifle a lot stronger, rename it the battle rifle, and make automatic weapons use the same perks as non-automatic weapons. Eight, if you've been to Far Harbor, you should be able to proclaim the superiority of Vim. So, yeah, that concludes the Fallout 4 rewrites. If you didn't like it, feel free to play the actual game instead. But as mentioned, there will be one last, not really a rewrite video, talking about why Far Harbor works really well and what Bethesda should learn from it going forward. So, until then, signing off.